Well, again, as Andy did at the beginning, we want to welcome you to our services tonight and to extend a very special welcome to those visiting in our midst, not only from the community, but from other places and other congregations in the area. But we're thankful that you are here tonight. You know, I was thinking there a few moments ago, one of the great things about having an association with a congregation for a little more than 40 years is you get to see a lot of changes over those years, and especially when living here five years and then coming back from time to time over the succeeding years. Of course, there are a lot of changes that take place. But one of the positive changes is to see a, another generation rise up and take responsibility for leadership. And some of the uh, men who are serving here as elders now were uh, in their teens or early 20s when I was living here. Uh, David Deagle was one of those younger boys running around here at the congregation when I lived here 40 years ago. And yet... Uh, now he's made a good, fine gospel preacher and uh, went through the preacher school here. Uh, many others of you uh, have done the same thing. You've stepped up and as some fall by the wayside through age and death, others come ar around to take their place. And I think that that's a wonderful thing. Some of those changes are hard to see. It's hard when you look in a certain place and expect to see a face there and that face is no longer there. But then again, it's good to see that another Another generation has come along and is standing firm and fast in the Lord's way. If you have your Bible with you and want to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, uh, it's not where we're going to start, but we're going to end up in Ephesians chapter 2 after a while. And that's kind of going to be our keynote uh, place. We're going to be talking tonight about abundant peace. Before we get there, though, let's remind ourselves where we've been in this journey as we've been talking about abundant living. It all started off with Jesus' mission statement in John chapter 10 and verse 10, where he says, The thief does not come except to kill and to steal and to destroy. I am come that they may have life, that they might have it more abundantly. Now the life that Jesus is talking about there, when he talks about abundant life, he does want us to enjoy life now. He wants us to enjoy the fruit and the products of being in him. He's not talking about material wealth. He's not talking about driving the biggest, fanciest car living in the biggest, fanciest house in the best part of town. He doesn't mean having the most successful job, but he does want us to enjoy an abundant life now. But it's in a spiritual sense. And he wants us to be able to, as we sang in that song a few moments ago, that whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That's what Jesus is meaning by the abundant life. That's what he came to give us. Then we saw that the abundant life begins, it commences with an abundance of forgiveness. This is what Jesus came to provide for us. Forgiveness of our sins, remission of our sins, cleansing from our sins, because that is our greatest need. We may think that we need physical health. We may need, think that we have all these other needs. But our greatest and priority need is forgiveness of our sins. We cannot find it anywhere else. We will not be able to find it on our own. We can only find it in Jesus Christ. Only He can provide that abundant mercy and grace to forgive us of our sins. Then we next saw the, the abundant life is motivated by an abundant love. Love for God, first of all, the greatest commandment. Love for neighbor as oneself, the second commandment. And we saw what that love looks like by looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. Read those verses, put your name where the word love should be, and see how you measure up. See how much love you are presenting to the world around you. Next, we saw that the abundant life is characterized by an abundance of good works. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 where there Paul says that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. An abundance of good works and we noticed in a number of passages of scripture some of those good works. Last night we looked at an abundance of joy. 
joy in the heart, joy in life, abundance of joy should characterize the Christian. We looked at the book of Philippians mainly to see there that Paul, even under his circumstances of being in prison, chained so that he could not travel and preach the gospel, which was his greatest love, yet he wrote one of the most joyful pieces of literature in the history of the world, and certainly one of the most joyful pieces of scripture that we find in our New Testaments. Well, tonight we're going to be looking at yet another of the characteristics of abundant living, and that is Jesus provides the means so that we can live an abundant life of peace. Now, peace in the New Testament doesn't mean just an absence of war or an absence of violence. Uh, we've become so accustomed to war and violence that if we have a period of time when those things are not bothering us or not infringing upon us, then we call that peace. But that's really not what the Bible means by the word peace. The word peace in the New Testament comes from a Greek word that in its basic meaning has to do with harmony in personal relationships, a state of well-being, and that's taken from a Greek lexicon. But we find, of course, in the Bible, there are a lot of exhortations, a lot of admonishments that we should live in peace. We'll notice some of those just for a moment. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9, you might remember there that Jesus says in the Beatitudes, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. In other words, we know some people who when they walk in the room, the tension just kind of builds because you're expecting some kind of confrontation. You're expecting some kind of an outburst, some kind of, of volatile expression. And then we've also known other people that when they walk in the room, there could be a lot of fussing and fighting going on. But when they walk into the room, things tend to calm down several notches. Everybody's blood pressure just kind of seems to get a little bit better when that person enters the room. That's a peacemaker. That's the kind of person that the Lord wants us to be. I think that Jesus was certainly that kind of person. When his, uh, the disciples were oftentimes fussing and fighting among themselves, uh, Jesus would ask, what are you talking about? And things would get very quiet. And then in a very gentle way and yet firm way, Jesus would show them that most of the time their fussing was about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus would show them this is not what you should be concerned about. You have other things you need to be concerned about rather than that. And as a matter of fact, if you want to follow a path to greatness, you take the form of the greatest service. You be the greatest servant of all. That is the one who will be greatest in the kingdom. But Jesus had a way of calming and bringing peace even among those disciples. And he brings peace to us today. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 18, the Apostle Paul there says to the Romans, If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Live peaceably with all men. Paul understood that it was not always going to be possible to live peacefully with everyone. He himself had run-ins with people. But what he is telling us here is, yes, there are some people it's impossible to get along with. But if there are people like that in your life, make sure, make double sure, make extra sure that the fault and the blame lies with the other person and not upon you. As much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now, Paul, of course, as we read through the book of Acts, and even as we read some of his letters, we realize there was some controversy in his life. He wouldn't back down from the truth. He wasn't going to compromise what the Word of God is in order to live peaceably with men. But he wanted to make sure that as he was preaching and as he was teaching, he was teaching the truth. And if they were angry, if they were upset, then they were upset as what he said and not with him personally. Upset with the truth and not necessarily with him because he wanted to live peaceably with all, but he wasn't going to compromise what he was saying. And then in Romans chapter 14 and verse 19, he says there, therefore let us pursue the things that make for peace and the things by which one may edify the other. 
Some translations use the expression there, let us follow after the things that make for peace. And I used to think that the word follow is more passive than the word pursue. And in our thinking and our connotations with those words, that's probably right. But then I stopped to think that, no, when you follow someone, that in, uh, expresses intention. And that uh, means that we're exerting effort. Uh, for example, there are several times when I have been behind a car that is going the same direction I'm going. And that car oftentimes is not going quite at the speed that I would like to be going. Now I'm behind that car and we're going the same direction. Some people might say, you're following that car. Well, actually I'm not. To follow something means that you're intentionally going the same direction behind that person. For example, there have been times when I've been driving home in the evenings and there's been a car that makes every turn that I make. And I begin to look in my mirror and think, is that car following me? And then I turn into my driveway, it goes on up the hill. And I realize, no, they were just going the same direction I was and happened to be behind me. But if you're following someone, that expresses intention. You've probably seen a movie or a TV show where someone gets in a taxi cab and they say, follow that car. And the taxi driver then begins to follow the car. Now, depending on the type of movie, that could be the climax and that could be a very tense situation and very dramatic. On the other hand, it can also be the most humorous part of that TV show or movie. Follow that car. But it expresses intention of going the same. Jesus says that we need, or Paul says, we need to follow after or pursue. Of course, the word pursue does carry with it the intention of energy and activity and expending a great deal of energy. That is how much the Bible, how much emphasis the Bible places upon peace. We need to pursue it. We need to intentionally follow after it in order to catch it and in order to make sure that our lives are filled with it. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. There Paul says, Finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Notice, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. The exhortation is to live in peace. The promise is that doing that, the God who gives peace, who is the source of peace, will be with us. Colossians 3 and verse 15. He says there, let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. You know, it's interesting, and this lesson doesn't have to do with gratitude, but I'd just like to challenge you to read Paul's letters and notice how many times when he is talking about prayer or when he's talking about other things, he always manages to slip in gratitude, thankfulness. Be thankful, he says. But the gratitude is coming from a heart that is being ruled, dominated by the peace of God ruling in our hearts. We have been called to that peace in the one body, the one church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in the second part of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 13, there Paul says, be at peace among yourselves. Now the church at Thessalonica, when you read those two uh, short letters, you'll find that there was apparently some strife there among some of them who had taken so seriously Paul's doctrine concerning the second coming of Christ that they were believing that it was going to be coming that he was going to be coming at any moment and they quit their work and were just sitting around waiting for the Lord to come well the second letter addresses that but that was probably causing some strife some conflict and Paul is encouraging them to be at peace among yourselves live in peace with one another 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 22 there Paul again tells the young preacher flee also youthful lusts but pursue righteousness faith love peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart 
And then again in Hebrews 12 and verse 14, the writer there says, Pursue peace with all men and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. And then Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, quoting from a psalm. He says, He who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Let him seek peace. And again, the word seek indicates something more than just giving a casual look around and say, well, I haven't found it yet. I guess it can't be found. That's what Diane says I do when I'm looking for anything that I've misplaced. She can go and find it immediately. I can look and look and turn things upside down and never find it. Some of you men, I see you're kind of shaking your heads yes, and some of your wives are saying yes, I agree with that. Seek it. Put a diligent effort into trying to find peace and finding it, then chase it. Pursue it, Peter says. And then, of course, we also know that in the Bible, there are a lot of prayers for peace. We're not going to take the time to look through all of these because most of them read almost exactly alike. Romans chapter 1, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 1, 3, 2 Corinthians 1, 2. All those passages listed there are the beginnings of the letters. And in those letters, it says, depending upon the, the writer, but it will say in Paul's letters, for example, Paul would say, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in First and Second Timothy and Titus, he actually says, grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, we also find that Peter in First Peter chapter 1, Second Peter chapter 1, John in 2 John 3, Jude in Jude verse 2, and John again in Revelation verse chapter 1 and verse 4 also says this at the very beginning beginning of the letters. But then you will also find that many prayers for peace come at the end of those letters. So what we find again is that these letters in the New Testament are framed, bracketed, you might say, peace at the beginning and peace at the end. Back in those days when they were writing, they didn't have access to some of the things that we have to emphasize something. Uh, we can make things bigger. We can make things bold. We can put them in italics. We can underline them. We can put exclamation points after them. We can do all kinds of things to draw attention to certain words. But what they did to draw attention to something was repeat it. Or they would place it in very strategic places within their documents. Paul and the New Testament writers, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, did both. They both repeated and they put it at, extreme, at, at strategic places, at the beginning and at the end. So that at the beginning of the letter, they're hearing the word peace. And at the end of the letter, they're hearing the word peace. It's emphasizing how important peace is in the life of a Christian. Well, then we need to also consider that there are a number of things we see in the New Testament that make for peace. What are the things that we can practice? What are the things that we can be doing that are going to enhance peace within us and peace to those who are around us? Well, the Bible gives us several indications. First of all, there is orderliness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 33, there Paul says that, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And he's writing that in a context that has specific application, primary application to worship. He's been dealing in chapters 12 through 14 of 1 Corinthians with spiritual gifts. In the first century church, they had those gifts. The apostles would lay their hands on certain ones, and the Holy Spirit would give them, impart unto them, miraculous, supernatural, spiritual gifts. Paul enumerates them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, a number of them. But he emphasizes the fact that those gifts were given, not in competition with each other, but to enhance and build up the church. They did not have the 
advantage of having a completed New Testament. And so they needed those spiritual gifts for the church to, in its infant stage to be growing and to be built up and nurtured in the Word of God. But at the church of Corinth, apparently there was the problem of people who were in competition with their spiritual gifts. And the result was, as we read those chapters, that some were speaking out of turn and out of order. And the worship assembly was in the danger of being much more confused than being building up and edifying to those who were there. And so Paul is writing to them how those gifts were to be used. And he ends it by saying that everything should be done decently and orderly because God isn't the one who is the author of confusion. Things that are confusing and things that cause confusion don't come from God. It comes from someone else. It comes from another source. It comes from somewhere else. God doesn't cause confusion. God is the author, the source of peace. And therefore, if there are things that come into our worship that are causing confusion among people, we need to stop and look very carefully at the source of that and get back to the Word of God and realize that if it's causing confusion and disorderliness and disorderly conduct in the worship, that's not God's doing. We need to get back to His ways, back to His Word. Orderliness is one way that will make for peace. Second, we find that the Bible says that righteousness, upright living, doing the right thing, that will help us to live in peace. James chapter 3 and verse 18, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Sowing. Remember the adage, Paul mentions it over in Galatians chapter 6, you reap what you sow. He who sows to the flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. He who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. You see, we reap what we sow. Are you sowing confusion? Are you sowing disharmony? Are you sowing things that are causing people to be at each other and competition with each other and backbiting each other? Then that's not good. Righteousness, the fruit of righteousness, is sown in peace by those who make peace. Getting back to being a peacemaker. And then we find the prayer also will help make for peace. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, and actually we're going to go on down to verse 9. Philippians 4, verses uh, 6 through 9. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. If there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Notice that in verse 7, Paul there says that one of the results of our prayers and supplications with thanksgivings, making our requests known, one of the uh, results of that is the peace of God will be with you. Then, you look down in verse 9, when we're doing the things that Paul had taught, practicing the things that he had taught to them and that they had learned, and we can do those same things, then he says, he turns it around. Verse 7 says the peace of God. Verse 9 says the God of peace. We can have both. The God of peace, he's the source of that peace. We need to be living in the peace of God. A peace that passes all understanding. We can't begin to fathom why it is that God can give us, provide for that, for us, that kind of peace. And then Colossians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Love is another quality that can make for peace. He says, above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. 
Notice that the peace comes after the love of God, the bond of perfection that we put on as Christians. And then in James chapter 3 and verse 17, there James tells us the wisdom also helps to lead us into peace. The wisdom that is above, uh, that is from above, is first pure and then peaceable and gentle, and willing to yield, and full of mercy and good fruits, and without partiality, and without hypocrisy. Wisdom from above is pure and peaceable. Again, human wisdom oftentimes is not that way. It's the opposite of that. But the wisdom that comes from God, the wisdom that comes from, from above, is pure and peaceable. So, to this point in our lesson, we have seen the exhortations to peace, prayers for peace, things that make for peace. But we're going to conclude this, series, this lesson tonight by looking at the fact that Jesus is our peace. He is the one and the only one that can provide the kind of peace that we're talking about tonight. It's prophesied all the way back in the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Remember there, Isaiah the prophet is told to prophesy. Unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Of course, the one who is being born here, whose birth is being foretold, yet in the future, is of course the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a messianic prophecy, prophecy of the coming Messiah. Jesus is that one who would be called by all those names. He is the one who would be the Prince of Peace. When he was about to be born, or when he was born, in Luke chapter 2, the announcement by the angels to the shepherds who were in their fields tending their flocks that night. The angel appeared to them, and they were saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will to men. Prophesied more than 700 years earlier by Isaiah, and on the very night of his birth, the angels are announcing on earth peace and goodwill toward men. And then Peter, when he was preaching to the house of Cornelius in the 10th chapter of Acts, when he came into that household, he began preaching to them concerning Jesus Christ. And he says, this is the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Preaching peace through Jesus Christ. Well, how is it that that peace comes? Well, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Paul there says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice that Paul did not write there. The Holy Spirit did not cause him to write there what some people say that he did. He didn't say, therefore, having been justified by faith only, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Some added that word to their translation based on Martin Luther's translating the Greek into German. And in the German language, he added that word. And many people followed him in other translations as well. But Paul couldn't have said that. To add that word would make him contradict himself. Because if you look just a little bit uh, before Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, if you look up to chapter 4 and verse 25, you'll find there that he says concerning Jesus that he was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised for our justification. So in a sense, we are justified by the resurrection of Christ. That's the very verse before Romans 5 and verse 1, where he says, therefore, having been justified by faith. It's true, we can be justified by the resurrection of Jesus as well as being justified by faith. A little bit later in chapter 5, he's going to say, we have been justified by his blood. When you have three things that close together that Paul says we're justified by, that indicates to me that there's no way he would have put only after any one of them. 
He doesn't say we were justified by the resurrection of Jesus only. He doesn't say we're justified by faith only. He doesn't say we're justified by the blood only. We're justified by all those things and other things as well. So to add the word only to that verse is to make Paul say something the Holy Spirit didn't intend for him to say and that he never intended to say. We're justified by faith, yes indeed, but we're not justified by faith only. But having been justified by faith, a result of that is we have peace with God. And when you understand that in the book of Romans, peace has to do in opposition to the wrath of God. Because Paul introduces the wrath of God in chapter 1, verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth, hold down the truth in their unrighteousness. And then he gives that long catalog, that list of sinful activity that brings God's wrath. And then in chapter 2 he shows that the upright moral person who's trying to save himself can't do that either. The Jew under the law trying to keep the law can't be justified by the law either. That won't bring peace. They're still under God's wrath as well. The only thing that can save us from the wrath of God is God's own initiative in providing the way of salvation. And that is explained in Romans chapter 3 verses 21 to 26. And then Romans chapters 4 through 8 continue to expand upon that. And here in chapter 5 to get out from under the wrath of God means that we now have peace. Having been justified from all of that unrighteousness and ungodliness of men, we now have peace because we're no longer under the wrath of God. And then we turn to our text that we announced at the beginning, Ephesians chapter 2. And we're not going to read all of verses 11 and following, but at least chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Paul there says concerning Jesus again, He Himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in His flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in Himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. He came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. Now when you see the expressions there, both, or the making of the two, one new person, he's talking about Jew and Gentile. That's what he began with in, earlier in the chapter. You Gentiles after the flesh, this is how you had lived. But we all did. But God has intervened in His grace and His love and His mercy in sending the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And then he goes on in the second part of Ephesians chapter 2, building on that. So he's talking about bringing all people together in this one body, in peace, the peace that only Jesus Christ can make. And this, again, doesn't have to do with the peace that we feel. It has to do with the objective peace that Jesus Christ brings by being our peace offering, bringing us out from under the wrath of God, where we no longer have to suffer the consequences, the eternal consequences of our sins, because we can be justified, or as the word Paul uses here, reconciled. And that word itself indicates that there's peace being made. Reconciliation indicates that there's been enmity. There's been a, a, a division. A friendship has been broken. A relationship has been strained. And now now, reconciliation takes place and the estranged parties are brought back together and peace has been restored. And that's what Jesus Christ does through His blood. That's what He does through the cross. As Paul says here, He uh, broke down the wall of, of partition. He reconciled them to God in one body through, that is, by means of, the cross. 
That is the peace. That's where our peace is found in Jesus Christ, in His blood shed at the cross. And then in Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, a similar passage of Scripture, it pleased the Father that in Him, that is in Christ, all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself, by Him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His Christ cross. Do you want to experience a life of peace? Do you want to enjoy the peace of God that passes all understanding that Paul speaks of in Philippians chapter 4? Do you want to pursue the things that make for peace? To follow after it intentionally? To expend energy to find it? To have it? To live in it? Then in order to do it, you must come through Jesus Christ. When we see all those things that Jesus gives us, the peace that He gives us and the ways that He gives us, the fact that it was prophesied that he would be the prince of peace, the fact that it was announced at his birth that on earth peace of, to men of good will, that we have peace having been justified by our faith, that we have peace through the blood of his cross. It's no wonder that as this is preached and proclaimed among men, as it is, the message is spread, it's no wonder that in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 15, Paul there says, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's a message of peace. It's the message that can bring, first of all, relationship, the reconciliation of God and man. God is not the one who moved away. We did. Therefore, God is not being reconciled to us, but we are to be reconciled to Him. And when that happens, peace is made between us and God. Having that peace between us and God then gives us the foundation that we can have peace with one another. Having peace with God, having peace among men, gives us the peace and the assurance of peace within. Friends, all the peace that we can ever hope to have, all the peace that we ever need is found in these principles in Jesus Christ. If you're here tonight and you've never yet obeyed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of peace, if you're seeking that peace, peace with God, peace with others, peace within yourself. In a moment, we're going to be standing and singing an invitation song, and we're encouraging you to step out on your faith in Jesus as the Son of God, acknowledging Him as your only Lord and Savior, repenting, turning away from the practice of sin, giving up the love of it, turning your back on sin and turning toward God. That's repentance. Making a confession of your faith in Jesus and then being buried with Him in baptism to have your sins washed in His precious blood. Or if you're here tonight and you're a wayward Christian, you've been living a life seeking peace and not able to find it. You're living in turmoil with people around you, perhaps within your own family, perhaps even with yourself. The only way that you're going to be able to find peace is to come back to your Lord Jesus Christ. Repenting of sin in your life, asking the prayers of your brothers and sisters in Christ to be restored to faithful and dedicated service in the Lord's church, His kingdom. Friend, whatever you need to do tonight, if you're seeking this peace that only Jesus can give, then the only way you'll find it is to come to Jesus tonight as we stand and sing to encourage you.